Hello, everybody, and this is the last AP World Lecture of 2020. So if you've been watching all of these lectures, great job. It's been fun recording these. It's given me a chance to refocus on the material. But today, what we're going to focus on are the revolutions of 1750 to 1900. Now, this is another section where there's a lot of material that we're really condensing for the purpose of uh, quick consumption. You could take uh, different classes and go into much more depth about each of these revolutions. In fact, if you went to college, you could probably just take a semester's worth of a class for each of these revolutions I'm about to go in. So my purpose is to paint with very broad strokes, but also give you enough information that you can see the distinct differences between the revolutions as well as their similarity. So, Without any further ado, as always with all of our lectures, let's talk about a basic overview. And the, the purpose of these overviews is to give you some concrete themes and similarities that you can work with when you, when you deal with the AP exam. So the first thing is that all of these revolutions have, have a heavy influence from a movement we call liberalism. So the liberal ideas of the 19th century are different than the liberal ideas of the 21st century. But in general, when we talk about liberalism, we're talking about a philosophy that favors change and favors challenges to tradition. And in the 1800s, the 17, 1800s, this um, challenge is embodied by the Enlightenment, which we talked about in the last lecture. So the Enlightenment ideas of natural rights and the idea of legal equality, where every individual that's part of a nation is seen by the law as equal. Those two ideals are keystones, the liberal philosophy of the late 17, early 1800s. And those are going to be cornerstones of these revolutions we're about to talk about. Second, there is rejection of existing political structure. There is some type of dissatisfaction with how government is structured in all of these revolutions. And there is a class, whether it be the Creoles in South America or the bourgeoisie in the French or the, the farming and the large farmer merchant class of the United States, they are rejecting the political model that is governing whether it be absolutism or a central parliament, they're getting rid of these colonial governments in most cases, or an absolutism government in most cases as well. We'll talk about that in more detail. They're all getting rid of these political structures. And then the third thing is the rejection of economic restraints. You can't dismiss the economic motivations because what's happening here in the 1800s is there's a growing movement to um, legitimize the ownership of property and to put that into legal code to protect property and also to open up opportunities for more business. Mercantilism restricts that opportunity. Mercantilism is, is going to be extremely restrictive and produces high regulations. So a lot of these revolutions are looking to get rid of the interference of government and economic activity. Now, while these, these revolutions are all motivated by liberal ideas, and again, we say liberal in the context of wanting change and challenging traditional authority, they are also going to witness continuities after revolution. So in other words, when the revolution's over, there's gonna be elements of the old society that persist. One of these elements is the social hierarchy, this idea that there are some groups of people who enjoy more privilege and status than other groups of people. And as we look at different um, nations, different regions, those social hierarchies, of course, will be different. But also, we're going to see continuity of economic models. While we may get rid of the mercantilism, we're still going to see plantation economies. We're still going to see um, a strong emphasis on farming. It's just that we've changed the way those things are governed and regulated. So we're going to see a lot of continuity as well as the change. So don't ever think that a revolution truly changes everything. 
In fact, most revolutions usually devolve into a split between one group of people who go, we've made enough change, and under the group of people who say, no, we have to completely change everything. And those two sides usually end up consuming each other. But that's a whole different story that we'll talk about another time. Significant results. When we look at the big picture of these, what we call the Atlantic revolutions or the revolutions of the 18th century, one major result is the independence of the American colonies. We know by this point there are colonies, Spanish, English, French, all throughout the Americas. And by about 1830, those colonies by and large are independent. There are still going to be a couple colonies throughout the Western Hemisphere, but by and large, this region has become independent by 1830, particularly in South America, Central America, as well as in the United States. Second, across the board, we have the emergence of a new political entity called the nation state. And that will be the last slide that we talk about in this lecture. But this development of what we call nationalism is critically important to world history because we're moving towards where we are today. Today, we are basically governed across this globe by nation states. And the nation state model is going to start taking root here in the 19th century. And then the last thing is what we might call damage to what we call conservatism. Now, there's a lot more to this, this notion that I'm about to introduce, but conservatism basically means a philosophy that honors and maintains tradition. So conservatism favors tradition. Liberalism favors change. You can understand why the two would conflict. Liberals will feel that conservatives aren't allowing for progress. Conservatives feel that liberals are introducing chaos into an orderly society and destroying the order. These two sides are going to be in great conflict. The conservative group in Europe, particularly, consists of the nobles, the church, and the king. Now, the church was already being damaged by the Reformation and by the emergence of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution. But the nobility are going to start losing their privileges across the board, and the kings are going to lose that divine right authority that they've always enjoyed. And there's going to be a movement in the 19th century for conservatism to try and reassert his power and influence, setting up the 19th century and the 20th century, and even the 21st century, to be this tension between conservatism, liberalism, and nationalism. And in a way, the past 250 years or so has been the story of those three forces pull, pushing and pulling with one another. But that's a whole different thing that we can talk about another time as well. So let's get to it. Let's start with the first revolution, the revolution you probably know the most about, the American Revolution. So because you know a lot about it, I just want to hit some of the major highlights. One, the motives. Resentment of taxes. Uh, basically, you have the American colonists being asked to pay more taxes by the British Parliament. But it isn't just taxes that drives the American colonists into revolution. It's also the, the belief or the perception that the British are violating traditional colonial governing. In other words, the United States or the American colonists were very accustomed to having a certain degree of autonomy, actually a significant degree of autonomy. And when the British start imposing taxes without the participation of the colonies in Parliament, that's when the backlash really starts to grow. Because it's more than just no taxation without representation. It's perceived as the British changing the rules on the colonists in America. And that, probably more than anything, in my opinion, provokes the revolution. I mean, think about it. It's not a hard concept. If you become accustomed to a way of doing things, and that way of doing things gives you a certain amount of freedom and liberty, and somebody tries to take that away from you, that is when you are going to be provoked into a response. And in this case, the British Parliament was, in a way, taking liberties and freedoms that the colonists were used to away from them. And that's going to provoke a lot of the backlash. 
Now, the American Revolution is steeped within the Enlightenment. And we see this particularly with the Declaration of Independence and its famous phrase that all men are created equal. We see in the Declaration a big um, connection to John Locke's idea of the social contract and the consent of the governed. And I know you probably just heard social contract and thought of Thomas Hobbes, but John Locke also believed in a social contract. He just had a different perception of where the power lay. But John Locke's idea that we have natural rights, such as life, liberty, and property, is embedded within the Declaration of Independence. Except for the Declaration of Independence, of course, says pursuit of happiness instead of property. So the Declaration of Independence lays out an argument for the equality of all men. And of course, today we've extended that to all people. And this idea that all people are by nature equal, that is a revolutionary idea. The next two documents, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, tries to put that ideal of all of, of equality into action. And the big thing I want you to appreciate about, the, appreciate about the Constitution is not only that it incorporates Montesquieu's ideas of separation of powers, but the Constitution also goes a long way to protecting private property, which was another ambition of this revolutionary group, the protection of property. And the Constitution goes to much depth of protecting property of individuals. And that brings me to the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, I, I include this because it is connected to the Enlightenment, of course, but also to this idea that the Bill of Rights is not granting people rights. The Bill of Rights is telling the government that they cannot step on the rights that are natural to the people. So take the freedom of speech. A lot of people think the Bill of Rights gives the freedom of speech to people. And that's not the case. People have freedom of speech by virtue of existence. It's a natural right. The First Amendment says Congress can pass no law abridging that freedom. So the Bill of Rights are laid out to be a protection of rights that were already part of humanity's rights, if you will. And it's something to keep in mind when we look at those three documents, they're pushing forward the ideal that all people are equal in the eyes of the law. And it pushes forward the idea that there should be no social classes, at least no legal social classes. So when you look at those three documents, there, there's a, a pursuit of equality within society. Equality means Everybody is treated the same by the law. Now we get to letter C, which deals with the continuity of social, of, of social hierarchies. In other words, we have these wonderful ideals, but the reality of the United States after the revolution is that we see a social hierarchy continue. Maybe the social hierarchy is not as embedded within the law as it was before the revolution, but it is certainly still there. So one thing would be the example of pa the power of property owning males. And usually, or almost always, the males are of European descent. These are the ones who are allowed to vote initially. These are the ones who have the greatest access to political and economic opportunities. So even though the law would see a man who owned property and a man who did not own property equally, the reality is is that the property-owning male had much greater power. And of course, I put in the male to make the point that the females of society still are regulated to a second-class citizen. And then, of course, number two, the continuity or the con uh, continuation of the practice of slavery. That slavery continues to be a practice in the United States, despite these promises of all people being created equal. And a lot of people would argue that the, the, the story of the United States in terms of its history is the constant pursuit in fulfilling the promise of the Declaration of Independence. And in a way, the revolution is not complete. So that is the American Revolution. That's one example. And the reason why I start off with it is because it's the earliest example. And this is where it's a significant revolution, because you have these British colonies rejecting British authority 
declaring their independence and becoming their own nation. That is big in history. And this nation is founded upon a principle of equal rights for all men. Now, you can talk about practice all you want, but the reality is, is that there's no other nation at that point which advances such principles. And this American Revolution is going to help to provoke the next revolution, which is the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution is going to happen the famous year is 1789. So American Revolution, we use the year 1776. French Revolution, we use 1789. In a lot of ways, the French Revolution is going to be the more impactful revolution of the two, actually, of all of them. What motivates the French Revolution is, is different than the U.S. Revolution because it deals with what's going on in France. One, the rigid social hierarchies. In France, the law recognized separate classes, what we call estates. And these three separate estates had rules and privileges associated with them. The estate that had the clergy and the nobility enjoyed incredible privilege. And the third estate, which involved everyone else, had a great deal of economic hardship. They were the ones, the big thing with this rigid social hierarchy is that the law basically said the nobles in the church, you do not have to pay taxes. Everybody else, you have to pay taxes. And that inequality, along with other inequalities, was, was a keystone of resentment um, throughout France. The second thing is the financial difficulties for France. The French government was bankrupt. And there's a variety of reasons for it that I won't necessarily go into. But this bankruptcy was causing a tension. And it was only a matter of time before everything fell apart. The king wanted to increase taxes on the nobility. But the nobility refused to go along because they didn't want to give that power to the king. And that tension escalates, escalates until we get to a, a revolution. So the financial difficulties of the French government, who are basically going bankrupt, is, is driving a lot of, it's, it's, the, it's the crisis that leads to the revolution. And it's one of those things that when we look at number two, France was an incredibly wealthy nation, but had a very poor government. And then our third thing is the rise of the bourgeoisie. So here's this class that I talked about back with the social hierarchies. The bourgeoisie are an emerging wealthy class that's making money off of trade, making money off of the joint stock companies. They're making money off of banking. They're highly educated. They're the ones reading the Enlightenment philosophers. They're as educated as the nobles and as wealthy as the nobles. But this bourgeoisie class feels left out of the governing of France, and they want in. So this revolution begins. I'm not going to go blow for blow on this revolution. In AP European history, I take about a week to go through this in detail. For our purposes, we're going to look at a couple big things. The results and influence. The French Revolution produces this document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And the Declaration of the Rights of Man does two things. One, it promotes the protection of property. It promotes this idea of equal rights. And the famous expression is liberty, equality, and fraternity. And those are the keystones or the cornerstones of the French Revolution. Another result is that feudalism comes to an end in France. The privileges of the noble class, the ability of the nobles to tax the, the peasants living on their land, all of that privilege comes to an end. So the French Revolution is trying to eliminate social um, separation, to, to eliminate social hierarchy, to eliminate privilege within society. However, the revolution splits in about 1792, 1793. And there's a radicalization of the revolution because there are those people who feel that the revolution hasn't gone far enough in truly changing society. And this leads us to a period of time called the Reign of Terror. And this is what we call the radicalization of the French Revolution. During that time, we see de-Christianization. 
In other words, the French government, under the, the rule of these radicals, will get rid of Christianity throughout France. Now, France is a strong Catholic state. The government says Christianity is holding us back from creating a new equal society. The Christian church reminds us of our medieval past. It's time to do away with it. So streets that had names after saints are renamed. They're taken down and they're renamed. The calendar, which, which has Christian connections, the idea of a seven-day week is based out of a biblical concept that God took six days to create the world and rested on the seventh. These French revolutionaries get rid of that calendar and they create a 10-day week because that's much more logical. The second thing is that these radicals do is end the monarchy and they create a republic. And they end the monarchy both figuratively and literally. The, the king of France, Louis XVI, has his head chopped off. And the end of the monarchy was meant to show that France is moving forward to a new society. France also decides that in order for it to really secure the gains of the revolution, they have to attack anybody who's against the ideals of the revolution, which is going to lead to a massive war of France, basically against all of Europe. To the French radicals, the threat to the revolution is outside as well as within. We'll talk about the within in a second. But all those nations that are around France that have their own monarchs are liable to attack France and try and restore the monarchy. That cannot happen. So France declares war on these different nations, taking it to them. The third or the fourth thing is the guillotine, the, the, the na nation's razor, as it was called. The guillotine, of course, is a very swift form of justice. It's, it's meant to execute people in a very efficient and actually humane way because the pain would be over very quickly. But the guillotine gets used on the enemies of the revolution to anybody who would speak out against the ideals of the revolution would find themselves on the wrong end of the guillotine. So the guillotine becomes a way of eliminating enemies from within France against the revolution. And the guillotine becomes out of control during the reign of terror. They find enemies everywhere and they begin to eliminate them because they're seen as standing in the way of progress. And then lastly, this French um, government is going to abolish slavery throughout their empire, which is an extremely radical moment. In 1794, the idea of a European nation abolishing slavery, that is driven by that concept of natural rights. And obviously, it's not going to last too long. We'll talk about that in a second. So what about the continuities? This French Revolution is pretty radical. But when it all shakes out after about 10 to 15 years, we see the rise of a figure named Napoleon. And Napoleon rises to power because people are tired of the revolution. The French people are sick of the radicalism of the revolution. So they turn to a strong military figure, Napoleon, to reestablish order in France. And Napoleon promises to keep the best elements of the revolution going while getting rid of the radical elements of the revolution. So what he does, in a way, he expands the revolution beyond France's border. And I think this is a very significant thing. As Napoleon expands France, he, he picks up those wars and he begins to be victorious. He goes into other parts of Europe and takes along the French ideals liberty and equality and fraternity. He brings an end to feudalism wherever he goes. He brings an end to serfdom wherever he goes. He truly does change the continent because the old systems start to get undermined. Third thing he does is he puts out a, a legal code called the Napoleonic Code. And the Napoleonic Code is going to um, institute protection of property and is also going to emphasize the role of men and fathers within their household. And that's why I have this idea of the patriarchy. So in one way, he preserves an element of the revolution, the protection of property. In another way, he promotes a more traditional 
pre-revolutionary concept, the concept of the patriarchy. And that's what we see a lot of under Napoleon is elements of traditional authority come back, not in full force, but they come back during Napoleon's time. While Napoleon also keeps elements of the revolution in place. The wealthy segments of society, the property owners, they continue to have privilege. Even though it may not be legal privilege, they still enjoy um, a, a, a more comfortable lifestyle. The equality that the French Revolution was fighting for may have become legal equality, but not economic or social equality. They do end the whole concept of social class divisions, but only in terms of the legal sense. Lastly, slavery is restored by Napoleon. Napoleon argues that slavery is a property issue and the government shouldn't be taking away people's property. So he reverses that abolition movement and brings slavery back to the French Empire. And then the last thing is the return of the monarch. So after Napoleon goes away, the French return to a monarchy, but now the monarchy is not as powerful as it used to be. So it is interesting that down the road, you have this revolution, it goes through so many twists, so many turns. And at the end, they end up back with the king, but the king is a little weaker. The social classes have gone away. Feudalism has come to an end, but owning property means you have more importance in the society. So we see some continuities and some changes. Um, and that's what I want you to appreciate about all these revolutions. Now we go to Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. So St. Dominique is a colony which today we call Haiti. And St. Dominique is a colony of French, or the French in the 1700s. And they are the wealthiest piece of property the French have. And as you might suspect, being in the West Indies, the basis for this wealth is sugar production. Sugar plantations are all over Haiti. And the productivity of this colony is going to be a huge source of revenue for the French. And of course, if you have so many sugar population, I'm sorry, sugar plantations all over the place, you're going to have a, an extremely large enslaved African population. The, the number of enslaved Africans probably outnumbered the free people by about 10 to 1. And this colony also had a history of the enslaved Africans resisting their, their, their conditions. Slave revolts would happen often. Maroon societies had formed. There's a tension between the enslaved population and the landowning population. And that's going to blow up at some point. And it blows up in about 18, 1799, 1800. And it's tied to the French Revolution. So you want to make sure Haitian Revolution and French Revolution go together. And that's an important element to this. The French Revolution changes the dynamics of Haiti. And to make a long story short, the French government tells Haiti, you have more local control. But there's classes that disagree about what that means, about who should have power and who shouldn't have power. And what happens in Haiti is a, a, re, a civil war breaks out amongst three groups of, of people, among the free people. Okay, And I don't want to get too much into the details because it gets more complicated. And these three groups begin fighting for power. And that's when Toussaint Louverture who um, is a mulatto. He's, he's a descendant of European and African-American heritage. I'm sorry, not African, I apologize. African heritage and European heritage in the Americas. So this European-African um, heritage mixes together and Toussaint Louverture is a production or a product of that of that mix. So he's carrying the enlightenment ideas that we're getting from European society, but he looks at what's happening to the enslaved Africans and said, this is a wrong. And he is going to mount 
a slave rebellion. Remember, the population is roughly 10 to 1. So what happens is Toussaint Louverture is going to lead this uprising of the enslaved Africans against the landowning class. And it is going to be highly successful, driving out the landowning class and establishing the end of slavery within Haiti. Now, here's the legacy. This is one of the most successful slave revolts in history. And it ends the practice of slavery in this colony. So here you have the, the enslaved Africans rising up and ending that system and taking over the nation and creating a nation governed by those people. It is Latin America's first successful revolution. So the United States is the first revolution of the Western Hemisphere that was successful but the first one in Latin America to reject Spanish rule, that's going to belong to Haiti. And a republic is going to be established. And it is not just the first republic of Latin America, and it's not the first dent in the Spanish, or the French empire, I should say. It's also the first republic in the Western Hemisphere governed by or former enslaved Africans. So you have a completely new government, not run by Europeans. In fact, it's a rejection of European control. And that's the third point. It's a rejection of European control. And now you have this former colony, now an independent nation called Haiti, that is governed by non-Europeans, that is governed by former enslaved and this is truly where we see the social hierarchy just rejected, okay? This whole system of slavery, the whole system of the property-owning people running the show, that has been kicked out in Haiti. And that is going to inspire, inspire other revolutions down the road. So another revolution is the South American, or what we might call the Latin American Revolution. I think South American revolutions is going to be more accurate. So what when we talk about the South American revolutions, I would say 1820s is your good year to remember. What are the motives? First, you have the Creole class. The Creole class, that European descent, uh, European, I'm sorry, people born in the Americas of European descent. And they are a significant landowning class. And they are a wealthy class, but they're shut out of government by the Spanish colonial system. So one thing is that the Creoles resent not being involved in the, the, the political leadership of this region. Second thing is they hate the policy of mercantilism. The Creoles are engaged in trade, and they resent having all these rules and regulations placed on them. So between mercantilism and their resentment of not being po the political power, a revolution builds and, and leads to Latin America or South American independence. So when we get to the results and the influences, we want to start with this leader named Simon Bolivar. Now, Bolivar is a Creole. So Bolivar has that European heritage. He has read the Enlightenment ideas, and he's going to take those Enlightenment ideals and put them into action. And his leadership is going to take South America into revolution against Spain. He writes a famous letter called the Jamaica Letter. And in the Jamaica Letter, he argues that the Creoles should be allowed to engage in business freely. So the Jamaica Letter is a lot like the Declaration of Independence and a lot like the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It's based on Enlightenment principles, and it's attempting to reject traditional authority. In this case, it's rejecting mercantilism. Now, this revolution is going to produce a war. Bolivar is going to be a significant leader of that war. There's going to be another one named San Martin who's going to be involved. And these wars for independence will eventually end the Spanish rule throughout South America. So just like in the United States or in North America, where the English were kicked out, 
by the uh, American colonists. Here in South America, the Spanish will be kicked out by the Creoles, the, the European colonists, or the American colonists, if you want to think of it that way. But in the United States, a nation was created that was a union of the different states. In South America, the different states are going to go their different ways. And we're going to have the formation of nation states all throughout South America. Bolivar wanted to have one united South America, much like the United States. What happens is you get a Colombia and a Venezuela and a Bolivia and a Paraguay and a Uruguay and a Chile and an Argentina. You get these separate nation states that govern their own affairs. So they all had in common that they worked together to get rid of the Spanish, but then they all go their separate ways and form their own nations. And that is going to create a vacuum of leadership. In other words, no one nation kind of takes, takes ownership of the region. Now you have a bunch of small states struggling to get going. And that opens the way for the United States to become involved in the 1820s. You might remember from U.S. history a thing called the Monroe Doctrine, which said that the United States basically saw Latin America as its backyard and said to European colonists, you need to stay out, or European powers, stay out of this region. And that means the United States is going to emerge as an influence in this region. We'll talk more about that another time. But within the South American region, you have a continuity. Racial social hierarchy will remain. That social pyramid that puts European descent at top, and then your mestizos and your mulattoes down at the second class, and your indigenous and enslaved Africans, that hierarchy is going to remain. Second, the patriarchy is going to remain. The idea that men have the privilege, women have no rights, that will stay intact. And then the third thing is that the Catholic Church will remain a significant power throughout South America. So even though the Catholic Church is associated with traditional authority, here in South America, it stays as an authority. So now we shift to the Mexican Revolution. I'm going to just mention this. Really, you can sum this up as there was a revolution in Mexico. So when it comes to motives, it's complicated. There's a variety of groups vying for power. Do not worry about the, that, that dynamic. The big thing I want you to see is that there is a group of people called the Mestizos, which you remember is a mixture of European and Native heritage. And we could also throw in the indigenous, um, indigenous people, the descendants of the Native Americans who lived there. Now, you'll notice I don't have much here about enslaved Africans or people of African descent. And that's because within Mexico, that is less of a portion of the population. So with Mexico, you have the indigenous people, you have the mestizos, and they are in poverty. They, they own very little property. And this is going to create uprisings. In 1815, there's going to be an uprising of the lower class. Now, when the lower class rebels, the land-owning class freaks out. And that's where the Creoles come into play in Mexico. The Creoles are worried that the lower class will rise up and grab their property. So the Creoles don't like that the lower class is going into rebellion. And then, without getting into too much detail, in Spain, there's a change in the government. And there is a worry that Spain will start putting in liberal changes to Mexico that will weaken the Creoles. So the Creoles are gonna go into rebellion. The Creoles are gonna kick the Spanish out and establish their own government. But they're doing it because they worry that the lower class will emerge and, and take over. And they're worried that changes will undermine their authority. So Mexico is more of a conservative-based revolution. But they're not trying to bring in new rights. The Creoles are trying to preserve their power, and their privilege. So what's the results of this revolution? The dominance of the Creoles and the dominance, of, the dominance of the church. They want to keep the power. So the power stays with the wealth. 
and the lower class, the mestizos and the natives, they lose out. And also in Mexico, it opens up for military rule because you have a group of people who are always worried that revolution will undo everything they have. And military dictators will emerge going forward that take advantage of that fear. Again, with the Mexican Revolution, I'm more concerned that you know that it happened than going into a lot of detail about it. Our last slide is the development of nationalism. So with nationalism, you have a couple different things. Nationalism, you guys have probably heard as love of one's nation. But we want to make nationalism a little bit deeper than that. Nationalism is a sense of connection between people that they come from the same group. Sometimes we can call this tribalism. But instead of us belonging to a tribe, we belong to a nation. And this is where language becomes critically important. It's no mistake that in the 19th century, in the 1800s, we start getting the official English language or the official French language. This is where we start getting the rules of grammar for a language. Because the idea is that language is what pulls the people together. They speak the common language. Dictionaries, which are really just books of words that belong to a language, become um, published during this period of time. So language is the glue that kind of pulls everybody together. That's one thing. Second, a nation can be defined as people who share a common language, but it also can be shared as a people who show, share a common history. And this is where history starts to tell the story of a group of people and how a group of people have emerged as a, as a unified group. So history goes beyond just kind of an objective telling of what happened, but rather a story that helps to explain the destiny of a people. And history becomes vital to defining the character of a nation. And then the next thing is the importance of ethnic unity, because there's a lot going on in the 19th century that has a lot of its foundations in what we have today. But the big thing is, is that all Germans see each other as brothers and sisters because they share common genetic, common racial, common ethnicity, whatever you want to say. The English see themselves as a people. And in some cases, we start throwing around this word race, the German race, the Italian race, the English race. This idea that they belong to a separate group of humanity different from everybody else. Now, this, this mindset of nationalism is a threat to empires. If you remember, I always talked about empires. One of the biggest challenges for empires is how they deal with diverse groups. Nationalism says there is no diverse group in our nation. We are one people. So the empire model is going to be threatened by this. And if you think about today, are there any empires really to speak of today? The answer is no. The empire model for now is gone. And if you think about the concept of human history, that's amazing because the empire model had always been with us. So what are some examples of these nationalistic groups that form? The countries of Germany and Italy are going to unify together during the 19th century and nationalism is going to be the driving force. To make the long story short, Germany used to be a bunch of little kingdoms and a bunch of little principalities. But in the 19th century, there's going to be a movement to bring all those groups of people together into one state, the state we call Germany. Italy is very similar. In Poland, Poland is under the control of Russia, but the Polish people are going to have rebellions. They're going to fail, or they're going to have rebellions against the Russians because they say, we are not Russian. We are Polish. We should have our own state. And then lastly, we go to an empire that we've talked about before, the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire, you remember, was religiously diverse, but also ethnically diverse. And the, the ethnicities of the Balkans 
which is the modern day Greece, Serbia, the Bosnia Herzegovina, that region of Southeast Europe, they're ethnically different than the Turkish. And there's going to be rebellions throughout the 19th century against the Ottoman Empire. One of the biggest ones is the Greek rebellion or the rebellion of, the, of Greece against the Ottomans. And what's happening is that this Ottoman Empire is starting to break apart as nationalist groups like the Greeks, the Serbs, um, begin to break away from the Ottoman Empire. So with that, I know that was a lot to throw at you guys at once, but that basically sums up the revolutions of the 19th century. So with that, we're going to kind of put a bookmark in AP World History, have a nice winter break. And in 2021, we'll pick up with Unit 5 and keep moving. Thank you guys very much. And as always, bring your questions to class. Bye.